remember when I was at the beginning of grade four and I had actually completed the grade six reading and math, these kits that we had to go through, these boxes with all these cards in them. And so at the beginning of grade four, they didn't know what to do with me. And I remember the principal and my teacher talking about me and, and, it, and it occurred to me, oh, they don't want to know what my best is because that's what I had been like full on with. They wanted me to be the best at what they're asking us to do, which I knew was very limited. And I can remember saying, oh, and if I if I'm too creative, it will interfere with that objective. And so I decided to not be creative anymore. I decided to just do whatever they asked us to do. And it worked because I graduated from high school, top marks in my school. I went on to U of T with a scholarship, got into law school very quickly, was called to the bar when I was 24. And I hated every minute of it. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 293 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Diane DeVegny. Diane is a former tax lawyer who shifted her focus to education reform when she became deeply troubled by learning struggles she observed in her children's classrooms. This has become her lifelong passion. With more than 20 years in the field, she's sharing her observations about literacy and learning in a Dear Genius series of books that starts with Harness the Hidden Power in Your ABCs. Her hope is that children and adults everywhere can finally find relief in the freedom to soar in their own zone of genius. And I so love this conversation, particularly because of the way that she talks about this foundation and creativity, which of course we all love and aspire to so much as creative people and as writers. And that's coming up later in the episode. First, Let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that allows you, the indie author, to get your books out into the wide world of audiobooks. More than 43 retail and library platforms are waiting for you and your awesome books through Findaway. You can use Findaway Voices to find a professional narrator. They have a Voices Marketplace where thousands of professional narrators from around the world are there and you can sample them, check them out, and see if they're right for your audiobook. You can also upload your own audiobook files if you've either done the audiobook yourself or if you've worked with a narrator directly, paid them up front, and want to load them to Findaway Voices. That's the great thing about Findaway is you have the choice, you have the options, you can even control your prices over at Findaway Voices. You can get into Chirp audiobook deals through Findaway Voices as well as special price promos on Apple and Barnes & Noble and other retail platforms. I love Findaway in particular because of that choice but also because it's getting my audiobooks into so many different library markets And when I'm talking to people and they're asking about whether my books are available in audio, I say, yeah, of course, you can get them through numerous different library wholesale platforms. Pretty much any library anywhere would have access to. And that's one of the great things about Findaway Voices. So if you want to check out how you, as an author, can leverage Findaway Voices, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. 
And now comments from recent episodes. Over on Twitter, Edwin Downward said about last week's episode, he said, This week's Stark Reflections with Mark Leslie brings to mind all the things we creatives bring to the table without even recognizing it. Every lesson, every experience, all of it informs what we do and how we do it. This is what makes our creation ours. Thanks so much, Edwin. And just to confirm, he's talking about episode 292, Learning by Doing and Baptism by Pyromancy with Oscar Soderbergh. And yeah, I, I agree with that so much, Edwin. So glad that you shared that. But yeah, it is your own. We bring so much of our uniqueness to our writing. And in, in, in this AI, in this AI-infused world, that has made all the difference. That authenticity, that humanity, those unique things from you. Yes, you, dear writer, that you bring to the table when you're, particularly when you're collaborating with all these great technologies that we can leverage as authors. There was also some fantastic love in a thread of 13 tweets about successful wine publishing from Vanya Margin uh, Rio including my interviews on uh, Six Figure Author Podcast and The Creative Pen, as well as love for my book, Wide for the Win. And, uh, and, and Vanya says, this is such a fantastic resource. All his nonfiction books are amazing, and I recommend checking them out. Well, thank you so much, Vanya. So greatly appreciated. I'm, I'm so glad you found it to be a fantastic resource because that's why I put these books together. I want to be able to help authors and and share a lot of the things that I you know compile on you know on the podcast and, and the interviews that I do, etc. I just want to compile them into a different format because different people learn different ways. Some people learn by listening, some people learn by reading, some people learn through visual, some people learn by doing, experiencing, etc. And again, it's kind of the topic. Uh, or it comes up a lot in, in this particular episode, of course. And I also want to say a, a huge thank you to everyone. And there were so many people, dozens and dozens of people who commented on and shared over on Twitter my BookBub blog guest post, 10 Tips for Growing a Wide Global Audience. And again, I was so honored uh, that the the good folks at BookBub asked me to write this article, um, even even working on the article with the, I guess, the project manager or editor who was involved in that was such a fantastic experience. It's that, that experience when you have a really good editor and it just feels so good. And you're like, yeah, I had this raw article and we kicked it back and forth a few times and even went to a proofreader and stuff. And and, and I think I think we came up with something really good together. So, you know, I, again, it's collaboration uh, that is, is key in a lot of great publishing relationships. And I loved uh, being able to collaborate with BookBub for that blog guest post. And thank you uh, so much for all the Twitter love and resharing of that article. Uh, over on uh, Patreon, what I did is, uh, this is our comment on one of the posts I gave to my patrons for uh, the audio. What I did is I had the audio uh, of that article from BookBub and I used an AI generated voice. Actually, my voice I trained and I'm trying to remember, uh, Eleven Labs, I believe, uh, was the tool I used. I, I trained, I, I uploaded five five-minute segments of, of my voice. And then I used that just to get that article out. Because again, for, for my awesome patrons, I want to give you guys access to articles and content. And since you, you know, obviously enjoy listening, uh, an article like that that's not in audio, I, I'm trying to translate into audio for, for patrons just to make it easier to consume. And so Maddie Dalrymple said that that synthesized voice is pretty impressive. And I agree. I'll share a little bit of that synthesized, synthesized, synthesized. See, I'm going to get that wrong, but the computer, well, we'll see if it, I'll, I'll have it say synthesized voice, see what it does. Uh, I'm actually going to play that right now. She sells synthesized voices softly by the seashore. This is a replica voice of Mark Leslie Lefebvre, trained by Eleven Labs Speech Synthesis. I generated this after loading a handful of sample files of me speaking, and it took just a few minutes for the system to process and generate this voice, which is based on mine. You might notice that it doesn't sound quite like me, but it's not bad. This entire text, by the way, comes to about 447 characters in the quota for the subscription I've paid for. 
So there you have the synthesized voice, uh, so you could hear it. And uh, and on Patreon as well, uh, Joanne Carson commented, and this goes back to the pseudo right walkthrough with Elizabeth and Ann West. And Joanne said, I learned something from every one of your episodes, but I particularly like this one because I've been thinking a lot about my relationship to AI in my writing. I tried pseudo write out for the free period and have now downloaded it. For me, it's an additional resource and acts like a thesaurus on steroids at times and at other times like a co-writer who doesn't care about my coffee breath. I'm giving it a one-year trial and then I'll see what the market has to offer. Uh, I want to thank you for keeping us informed about what's going on out there in the big world of publishing. And uh, and great, thank you so much, Joanne. I'm so glad that you see it as a potential tool that you can use to benefit and, and yeah, my computer never complains about my coffee breath or the fact that sometimes sometimes um, gaseous emissions happen in this office where I'm recording the podcast. Not just from me, but of course from a couple of the dogs that hang out here with me. They're way worse than, than I am. Must be something they ate. But uh, uh, thank you to uh, to Joanne and Maddie and to new patron Lydia Q. Welcome, Lydia, to the patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. Thank you to you and welcome, Lydia. And thank you to all of the awesome folks who support this podcast over on Patreon. If you want to support the podcast, yes, you have that option of Patreon. You can also leave a review, share the podcast, of course, with someone else that you think may find value in the content that you're listening to. And that's it for comments. But speaking of comments, I am coming up on episode 300. Yeah, we can do the math. Seven episodes from now, episode 300 is going to come out. And I wrote this down. I had to do that. I had to do the math. I said, okay, so, you know, March 3rd is episode 293. March 10th is 294, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. April 21st is going to be the 300th episode of this podcast. And that, dear listener, is where you come in. I cannot have a 300th episode without you. Because the 300th episode of this podcast is going to be your reflections. That's right, your reflections. I want to hear your comments. I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear your stark reflections about anything related to the business of writing and publishing. Is it something you've learned on the journey? Is it something you're learning on the journey? Is it something you want to learn on the journey? Is it something from a past episode that you wanted to reflect on because you listened to it and it gave you an idea and it made you think about something? I'd love for you please to share that with me and all fellow listeners. And I'm going to have a form. It's going to be over at starkreflections.ca slash 300. And there'll be a link to that in the show notes. And there'll be a form where you can submit an audio upload. You can record yourself doing a reflection, upload that. I'll use the clip in the show, introduce you, etc. There's a spot where you can tell me some information about you. So before each, each one, I can introduce you. Or if you, you know, don't have the technology to record the audio or you're a little bit shy and don't want your voice to be heard, well, of course you can you can enter the text and I'll uh, do you the honor of reading that. Who knows, maybe I'll even have some, some guests read for me. Some surprise guests. Let's see what happens. But again, well, I'm going to say I can't do the episode without you. I'm going to do the episode regardless. But please don't let it just be me babbling. I would love to hear your reflections, your thoughts for episode 300. And that's coming up in only seven weeks from as I'm posting this. Again, the link will be starkreflections.ca slash 300. And that's where you'll find the form to submit. I'm going to have to cut it off a few days before April. What did I say? April 21st. Probably have to cut that off on April 19th. So I'll have a chance to get everything together, compile everything for the special 300th episode. But yeah, I do want you, dear listener, to be a part of that. So that is it for my pre-babble. I, of course, have other personal things to do, but ah, I can get to the personal stuff in next episode, right? I can get to personal stuff anytime in my podcast because, you know, it's my podcast and pretty much most of my babbling is personal stuff. But... Without further ado, why don't we get to the main content, which is my fantastic conversation with Diane DeVenny. Hey 
Hey, Diane, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. So to, where to begin is always the question. I think where to begin is maybe uh, your background before we get into some of the topics, uh, sort of your background uh, in the field we're going to be talking about, as well as as a creative person and writer. Well, I started off being very not creative because I thought I was going to be a tax lawyer. Okay. And uh, and because of my children, I realized that I have a real passion for educational reform. Okay. And and threw myself into that as deeply as I had becoming a lawyer. Right. And and it's been a, a really interesting, challenging path, especially when you unexpectedly announce at a workshop that you are here to revamp education on the planet. What, what, you, that's what you did? So, yeah, I, I was looking for ways to really support my children. And, and somebody had introduced me to this, actually a dyslexia correction program that I saw as having an amazing approach for learning for everyone, what they now call universal design. It okay. not only prevents problems for those who don't learn in traditional ways, but it also enriches everybody's capacity to learn. But there I was with 35 seasoned educators, and and I was um, the only non-educator in the room, and we had to introduce ourselves. So I stood up and I said, I'm Diane Deveni. I'm a mother of three, tax lawyer, and I'm here to revamp education on the planet. And then I sat down. I kind of went, oh my gosh, what did I just say in 1999, which is when this happened, right. who was talking about the planet? What could that even look like? The only thing I felt was that it was true. And then this woman came rushing up to me and she said, you're the only person here I'm really interested in talking to. She said, that's amazing. That's like a 20 year job. And I thought, oh, there's no way it's going to take 20 years, <laughs> but here I am and 2023 and and really feeling like it's time to to do the big launch of the vision that I've been growing for all of this time. So what what is that vision then? Well, the vision is that we really have an education system that supports 21st century humans um, because <laughs> we know any of us who have paid attention to where the history of education was, it was um, in the famous words of Bill Gates' grandfather, who was working in collaboration with Rockefeller and Carnegie, um, that they didn't want thinkers, they wanted workers. And, and so they've done a really good job at creating workers. And in the 21st century, if you're not a thinker, and you know, one of my favorite quotes is Alvin Toffler, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write. They will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And Love and that. I know it's it's awesome. And so so that's my focus. How do we get everybody to have the capacity to unlearn and relearn? But not only that, but have it in a place that um, the, is according to their passions and their interests, because each one of us is born with unique skills and interests and nature loves diversity and diversity needs to be uh, encouraged and nurtured and developed so that we have among the population, people who have the ability to come up with creative solutions for all the challenges that we have in front of us. So I can imagine, and I'm not I'm not going to get into the politics of things, but school boards and local governments and et cetera, uh, municipal, regional, all the things, they operate in typically four-year terms. And, and how many terms, it, nobody can see it through. Now, you've been working on this for over 20 years, but you're also working probably with existing entities that are not designed for long-term thinking, it seems like, right? Well, certainly when you're talking about public education, um, and that's why one of um, the ways that I have been doing my work is finding families who want to experience what I offer and and create this grassroots movement. Okay. But along the way, you also encounter occasional real education advocates in the system. And we're working together to find ways to to shift things. And I think... It used to be that 
everybody was able to do things in the privacy of their own office. And now nobody has the luxury of being private anymore. And so if you have enough interest and you use social media correctly, you can encourage massive shifts. And and then occasionally champions will show up. I, I just learned that the mayor of New York is dyslexic. Didn't know till um, he was an adult that that was a challenge that he had. Right. And he's really committed to turning things around for the schools in New York City. Oh, wow. Okay. So so anything is possible when when there's a will. And so, and you've been working, you talked about the grassroots and specifically with families, because again, it, is it almost like those who've chosen not to send their children into the traditional education system but to do homeschooling i have a good friend who has done a remarkable job of creating creating a a, a curriculum of creating thinkers right. and 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 people who can be passionate about different experiences as opposed to good factory workers i guess yes and the challenge is Every once in a while, there's an individual who learns differently, who picks up literacy skills differently. Right. And if you don't know how to support them, then it, it becomes, you know, this this puzzle that you're trying to solve. And and so that's where I'm coming in because I've I, I've really now settled on a hidden root cause of many issues in literacy and learning and that even often lead to attention issues and and the thing that's so surprising about it is that it's actually really easy to resolve when you know what you're looking for right so yeah so it's it's now now i'm really excited to be sharing this out in the world in the biggest way possible <laughs> and one of the ways you're sharing it is is a a, a new book relatively new book can you talk a little bit about that and and how this helps people? Yeah, so Dear Genius, Harness the Hidden Power in Your ABCs is really showing how we underestimate the importance of having a solid foundation, particularly with respect to the actual letters of the alphabet. And for people who are really wildly visual thinkers who can bend reality, whether as an athlete or as a musician or an artist, you know, think about all the actors who are now publicly stating uh, that they have dyslexic symptoms and they have the ability to be somebody else in right. a believable way. So they, they all have this ability to bend reality and nobody has shown them how to use those talents to actually be successful with literacy. And and it's it's not that complicated. In fact, I trained with a man who was autistic and dyslexic and didn't speak until he was 12 years old. And in his late 30s, he understood that there were certain things you could do that would be the foundation. And and that was who I trained with in 1999. And I I found out that in the 1990s, they had done a six year study in California schools and had children from grades one through three experienced some of this, this way of learning, they had not one referral to special ed, not one diagnosis of ADD, and two to eight times the national average being referred to gifted programs. And wow. I thought, wow, this is amazing. Um, I, I just was so excited to watch it unfold and take over the education system. And it didn't happen. And, and I started looking at, well, why didn't it happen? Well, because the way that they did it, they had a lot of parent volunteers so that the parents were helping the children experience these programs, but they never worked with more than six children at a time, which is not going to happen in a classroom. So you can't, you, you know, you can't go into any school and say, well, you know, as long as you can get a whole army of parent volunteers and never, see, you know, then, then this is going to really work. And they're going to go, thank you. Um, so I, I said, okay, my job is to figure out how to make this work in a classroom setting. And that's when I started in Toronto schools doing pilot projects for a number of years. And I created a whole new process and system and materials for achieving the same result but it could be done by one teacher in a classroom. And it's through collaboration, through team building, all the other skills that we want to develop anyway, you know, the social 
emotional learning, all right. of that coming into play. And so to prove it, I opened up a summer camp and I had 80 campers and I could facilitate 80 campers at one time with this program. And we had phenomenal results. The only reason I stopped doing it is somebody said, Hey, why don't you think about getting a degree in education? Cause all I had was a law degree. And so, so <laughs> all I, I went, had was a law. Degree. All, I, all I had was a law degree, <laughs> which, which, which opens doors when you want to talk to people, but it also has them wondering like, what do you know about education? And yeah. so, so I went back to school to get a master's degree in education. And on the first day I found out that there's no summer holiday in graduate school, in law school, we had summer breaks and I clerked right. for, for judges as part of my summer break job. And, <laughs> and I didn't know that there was no summer holiday. And so I went and I said, well, but I have this summer camp I'm doing. And they said, well, you could turn it into a research project, but here's the stack of, of approvals that you'll need to go through to be able to, to have children involved in research. And I said, okay, not going to do that. Wow. Um, but I, I now I have I have been putting together a concept that I've been working on ever since then of having families go to resorts or possibly on cruise ships and have this immersive experience together oh. um, where, where they all go through it. And, and sometimes, and so now the, the special thing that I do in my, my private programs is I have the parents experience the same thing that their children do for themselves. They think, oh yes, I'll help Johnny. I say, no, 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 no. Johnny's got his own thing. You've got your own dashboard, all your materials. You're going to do right. the same thing. Um, Cause we don't want Johnny to get smarter than you. And it's inevitable if, <laughs> if, if, if you don't do it as well. So, um, so that's what we do. So, uh, so, so for the book then is the book for parents is the book for educators. Who is this book for? Well, I I wrote it to who I call the genius, um, and I I had in mind somebody in their twenties or possibly their thirties who still kind of is walking around a little bit wounded from ideas that they don't have the ability to write neatly or read as fast or spell properly or all those things that that were never resolved, and so I wrote it to them. But okay. I was always expecting a parent or a teacher to be reading over their shoulder. And, 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 and getting, getting all the information kind of vicariously. Okay. All right. So, and, and that's very much like the program is it's like, no, no, you're doing the homework too, right? right? You're not just, you're not just assisting with the homework. You've got your own plate to, to deal with. Right. Yeah. And, and it's been really fun to see parents, you know, like a chartered accountant or highly educated parents going through this and just having it blow their mind up. Wow. Like they're just like, Whoa, I had no idea. And I know that from my own experience. Like when I was working with Ron Davis, I I found like, because one of the things we do is we actually form and um and learn the letters out of clay. And 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 it's this that whole kinesthetic thing that opened up for me. And I because I used to joke and I used to say, I'm a recovering lawyer. I'm recovering from <laughs> thinking this is where it all happens. And and it and it it woke up in me the capacity to feel comprehension, like feel comprehension in every cell of my body. And oh, I thought, wow. wow. And it turned me into um, somebody who wanted to keep exploring that. And one way that I did was I decided to take on partner dancing, which I'd been afraid to do my whole life, like dancing, you know, like, like ballroom and, and Latin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah as opposed all of those to, things. Yeah. okay. And, wow. and, um, and I became a danceaholic. And I, I learned 10 styles of dance. I like, and, and just every, like, it just completely changed my life. Um, the other thing that started happening is because I unlocked my creativity that I had been, you know, I, I had actually put in prison so that I could be a successful student. Um, when I, when I released that, I started writing spoken word poetry out of the blue and, um, and and it still happens from time to time. I never know. And in fact, one time it happened when I when I thought I was writing the introduction of the book. Um, I was like, oh, my gosh, it's one of those poems again. And <laughs> and and so it that poem is on page 108 of at the back of the book. Um, I just kind of oh, tucked wow. it in there as a 
special bonus in the index. It just says special bonus, um, just so people could could see a little bit of that. So I'm curious about how how that got unlocked uh, in in you that that you know the passion for dance, the spoken word poetry that. I, had it been there before and you said you just kind of locked it away or was it something you never even were allowed to explore? Well, I remember when I was at the beginning of grade four and I had actually completed the grade six reading and math, these kits that we had to go through these boxes with all these cards in them. And so at the beginning of grade four, they didn't know what to do with me. And I remember the principal and my teacher talking about me and, and it and it occurred to me, oh, they don't want to know what my best is because that's what I had been like full on with. They wanted me to be the best at what they're asking us to do, <laughs> which I knew was very limited. And I can remember saying, oh, and if I if I'm too creative, it will interfere with that objective. And so I decided to not be creative anymore. I decided to just do whatever they asked us to do. And, and it worked because I graduated from high school, at top marks in my school. I went on to U of T with a scholarship, got into law school very quickly. It was called to the bar when I was 24 and I hated every minute of it. Wow. Like I hated it, but I did it. And, um, and it wasn't until I went back to school with my master's program in education, because I was passionate about it. I loved it to the point that I, I found out that I was already at my end of my credits that I was supposed to accumulate before getting onto my final research project. I went, no, no, I'm not finished. I actually took two <laughs> extra credits because I, I, like there was just so much I wanted to learn. And so it was a completely different experience when you suddenly connect into the truth of who you are. And I say, I think our education system dismembers us. We separate our mind, our body, our heart within ourselves. We feel separate from each other when we feel in competition and isolation in that way. Yeah. And then and then we're we're not educated to be connected to our entire world. And that and if we look we see what's happening with all the environmental destruction that's like, you know, happening everywhere, um, including in my own neighborhood in Moss Park in Toronto, they just cut down 61 mature trees that were 50 to 70 years old to make it easy to put a subway instead of going underground. They're just, you know, took, took over the neighborhood park. And and I'm like, do you not understand what trees do? But that's and and I said, this is this is an example of the result of the education system we have. At first, I was saying it's failure of the education system, but you have to remember the the purpose of the education was to produce workers. So right. so it's not there. It's not a failure to them, but it is to humanity if we really want to truly find out who we are. Wow. So I know, uh, and you're we're going to talk about, you've got some workshops and things like that coming up where people can check them out, but I want to go back to the book itself. So if somebody is curious, uh, at wanting to unlearn, wanting to, uh, what even more advanced ages, I might say, than the 20 to 30 year old, is that something that a 50 year old middle-aged bald guy might be well, able to pick up? <laughs> so far, my oldest student so far was 77. Okay. All right. But there's a 96 year old who I'm trying to get to join one of my, okay. my, my next groups because he told me he's always had messy writing his whole life. And, and I said, well, then you have to go through this and he might do it with his grandson. Oh, that'd yeah. be, that'd be interesting too. Yeah. And I imagine the grandson's not even writing uh, learning cursive. The grandson's learning printing, right? Well, I think he might be in a, some schools, some private schools still do teach cursive. Okay. Um, and what's interesting is I, I, I've just been working with a family um, who live in Cambridge in the UK and um, they, they only focus on cursive. They, they have a rudimentary introduction to printed letters and okay. then they jump right into cursive. And this little eight-year-old boy 
was really struggling. And so we have revisited and he's relearned all of his printed letters, but transferring that into his hand was another step of unlearning the cursive for a period of time so that he could integrate the printed and then uh, return to the cursive. But right now he's been working on the printed. And the reason that the printed is so important, and even if you're saying, well, what difference does it make? I, I'm on the computer all day, I'm on my phone. I never write anything by hand. Um, the fact is everything you read is those printed letters. And if, if there's any gap in your foundation, any confusion whatsoever, it is interfering with your ability to be focused and your ability to reach what's even your highest potential. Wow. It, it, it almost, it feels almost like, um, you know, when you visit your dentist and the dental hygienist reminds you that so many of your health, so much of your overall health, mental and physical health comes back to dental hygiene. It almost yeah. feels like the writing is like a kind of dental hygiene for for other things in your creative life? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a that's a great analogy because it's it it really is it's it's at the root of everything. And and having those letters with certainty and having the capacity to reproduce them means right. that you've got this connection. You know, in my my kind of insatiable learning patterns. The Another thing that I've done is I certified as a yoga instructor because I wanted to understand the mind, body, heart connection okay. better for learning. Yeah. And, and when we were doing our training, we were told we had to write everything down by hand. We were told it goes from your hand through your heart into your head. Like this is a, this is a highway okay. that, um, that is, it just activates the, the complete human. So, yeah, so it, it, it is really, it's, it's so much more important than people realize. And even if you laugh it off or you, or, or you joke about it, or you, or, or you apologize for whenever all those rare times when you have to write a card or whatever you do, you may say, well, it's not a big deal, but the thing is, it's really easy to resolve and it's an amazing practice in unlearning and relearning something so that you are primed to be able to do that in other ways in your life so that you have this sense of resilience the other thing that we do is we learn the alphabet forward and backwards and you're activating your visual abilities so that you can really connect into what each letter looks like and um and so it's such a boost when somebody, you know, in the group will will now show that they've got it, and 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 it's amazing what happens when wow. when you when you have that experience, you know, even the parents, the parents like they're they're equally proud of their accomplishments as <laughs> as the children are. Oh wow! I love that. So you have uh, you have some uh, boot camps, uh, March, uh, March programs that you're doing. Right. So, um, so I'm, I'm saying these are for anyone who's looking at fixing messy writing, okay. I guarantee in the two days, um, that, that we do this. And so I've, my online programs up until now have been eight weeks and to give people time to do things, um, right. a variety of things. And now I've decided the two day immersion, is really powerful. Like when, when from one day, when you show up on Saturday to the Sunday, when you leave, the transformation is so huge that it, it, it just is life-changing. And so that's why I've decided now, now you're going to get some online pre pre actions to do so that you're familiar with what happens when you show up for the two days. And then there's a three week positive psychology integration workbook that you you get to like practice um your new letters in a, in activities that positive psychology has shown to increase your positivity your ability to do everything so so but in those two days it's really powerful and so for march this is since lockdown we haven't done anything in person everything's been online and right. now we're saying, you know what march we're going to do every single weekend in march and the last weekend in March will be for people who are joining us virtually, but in person, we're going to be doing them. And we've got an extra 
time during March break as well. So, so uh, because it's just, it's so powerful when it happens in two days, like it's, it's yeah. great. And people appreciate it when it happens over a couple of weeks, but in two days, it's just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe what just happened. Well, I think there's something powerful about the immersion. I know I, my last name is French, but I've never really spoken French. The closest I've come to actually thinking and interacting in French is when I've been immersed in France with only French speakers or in certain parts of Montreal when I was there for just a week. But mm -hmm. I had no choice but to speak French. And it was like that it the light bulb clicked. It was it was kind of like I can't get lazy and resort back to English. So it's almost like that immersion of uh, two days could be really valuable because it's it's powerful. Absolutely. And just as you said, you there's this moment of that clicks and and you you can never go back. You you never go back. Like your your way of thinking, your way of thinking about yourself, every right. uh, and and your curiosity and enthusiasm for life suddenly gets this kickstart. And right. And, and that, yeah, there's something about it. And that's why I've decided this is what we're going back to. Wow. Wow. This is, uh, this is fascinating. So your book is available uh, online. People can order it. Yeah. So you can order it at the learningforce.com, which is our website. Um, it's also available at, on, on Amazon. We're looking at other distribution methods as well. Um, and, and the course is also, you can get more information um, at the learningforce.com. Awesome. Uh, and so the one last question that I think is, is is a fun one is, so one message that you would love the world to hear, what would, what would that one message be? I think we are more powerful than we believe. And I encourage every one of us to think of ways that we can all be in charge for a change. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Again, just a reminder, Diane, where can people find out more about your program and you online? TheLearningForce.com. That's force like the force be with you. May the learning force be with you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Diane, thanks so much for spending the time to uh, chat with me today. It's been great. Thank you so much, Mark. Ah, learning and unlearning or unlearning and learning such a wonderful conversation. I, I'm holding Dear Genius Harness the Hidden Power in your ABCs because I know, I know that my handwriting is pretty atrocious. I take notes at writers' conferences. I can't even read them. I used to have pretty decent printing and a weird combination of cursive and printing that uh, was the style I used. But I let it get sloppy over the years. And so I purchased this book because I want to go through and I want to... Uh, <laughs> chapter 3, Your Letter Disorder is Showing. And, uh, and and I wanted to go through that. Of course, I also wanted very, very briefly... Diane talks about the poem on page 108 of the book. And I thought I'd treat you, dear listener, to a little bit of the beginning of the poem. Just as a nice teaser. Dear genius, yes, I'm talking to you. You whose eyes betray the wounds of being the bully or the bullied in the schoolyard, remembering to this day the feeling of the pit in your stomach, that day when you gave the wrong answer in class, and everyone laughed. I hear what you think you can or cannot do, and what your third grade teacher sent home in notes about your missing the brains, focus, or effort boats. It's time to cross the moat from that world with your banner unfurled and wearing the coat of endless possibilities. I'll read the whole poem for those of you over on patreon.com slash starkreflections because I think it's a pretty awesome poem. But I think what Diane's doing is pretty awesome. And that's why I wanted to reflect on the unlearning and learning you know, one, one of my creative heroes, uh, Neil Peart, and I know I've reflected on this before, but it, it's worth reflecting. doesn't matter how many awards the man has won in his career as the drummer for Rush. He went back and had unlearned and relearned the drums. I mean, already having been, you know, one of the top drummers ever in the world, still went back. He was in his 40s and 50s. And 
and unlearned all the techniques and relearned new techniques because he constantly wanted to improve. He constantly wanted to get better. As my dear friend, who who was a close friend of Neil's, said, uh, ended one of his presentations at Superstars Writing Seminars a few weeks ago. He He quoted Neil, who used to say, what is the most excellent thing I can do today? And, and I want to take that phrase and kind of repurpose it in a little way as, what is the most excellent thing I can learn today? Because we can all learn. We can all unlearn. We can relearn. And unlearning is so important because with the learning we had, there's sometimes the assumption that we know everything. And it's really important for us to understand that as, as compassionate and wonderful and smart and as learned as we are, there are still things that we can keep learning about ourselves, about the world around us. I'm not sure if I've mentioned on the podcast or not, but I have applied for a master's with a focus on publishing program from uh, Western Colorado University. And, 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 and again, my, my friend Kevin Anderson is, is the director of that program. It's a virtual program, so I don't need to be away for more than the, the two-week residency. The, the first week, it starts in July of 2023, where I'll have to be there in Gunnison, Colorado, a beautiful, just gorgeous campus. And, uh, and then it's virtual, and then I'll, I'll be there again next year in, uh, in residency for the sort of the final residency, and that's the, also the week of graduation. And, and, and why? So I've, I've worked in the book industry I started in 1992, and, I, and I've worked throughout the industry. I've I've been in the trenches as a writer for all these years. I've learned so much about the publishing industry and, and the business of writing and publishing. But even at the age of 53, I'm still learning every single day. It's why I listen to so many podcasts and read so many different articles and trying to stay in touch and listen to what different authors are doing and attend and learn and constantly absorb and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go back to school. So so last night, and la- last night would have been March 1st, there was a, a virtual Zoom session uh, with the director, um, Kevin's boss, the director, Tyler, and, uh, and, and, and a bunch of other students who were uh, accepted into the graduate program. And it was sort of like a, a introductory to orientation and finding out about the, the residences where we can, uh, where we can stay when we're in town and a little bit about how the how that orientation works and how the program works etc and and I'll be honest when when I was in university I just well when I was in high school there were there were th- I, I did love English class and and I liked certain things about high school but I just wanted to get the heck out of there and at Carleton University I did really love some of my classes I loved the theater uh, Sock and Buskin Theater Company at Carleton University that I did. I, I loved uh, quite a quite a few of the extracurricular, you know, the job I had at the theater, were doing uh, lighting and sound design and, and backstage stuff, and um, stage tech stuff, I should say. Learning lighting design was phenomenal. Getting to work uh, in as an assistant manager, stage manager, not so much stage manager. I was a way better assistant than I was a stage manager. Uh, Andrea Clasper was still, uh, you know, the the key, the king, the queen of of stage management, uh, the goddess of stage management, uh, dear friend of mine, and and I, I, like she's just the best boss ever, and and I was her assistant manager a lot. Uh, had a really really great working relationship with her, but I university I was just. I, I don't know what it was, I guess because I was getting a degree in English, and yeah, I loved reading, and I loved books, and I loved talking about it, but all these decades later, I'm, I'm at the meeting last night, and I was so pumped, I was so enthusiastic. There were there were people from the, the parallel disciplines, so there's, there's the MA and MFA pro- programs, and I'm not in the MFA, I'm, I'm just in a one-year MA program, and with, with the concentration on publishing. But there's folks from nature writing and genre writing and screenwriting and poetry and and you know I was just enthusiastic being with these people who are also like me and and several of them were older like myself 
and just so enthused to 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 want to be there because when I went to university it was like oh, you have to do this you have to do this and now I want to do this I mean I was I was there last year in Gunnison they flew me in they paid me to go and and do some guest lectures in in Kevin and Allison's courses for the publishing concentration I got to spend a week immersed as you heard uh, Diane talk about that immersion I was immersed there with the students for a week and and instead of just showing up just for for my lectures now I, I still had work to do and stuff from the hotel room but I, I did a lot of my work from just outside the classroom so I could still listen to and attend to what was going on and I remember I remember tears in my eyes watching with pride watching the graduation of some of the cohorts because again I'd, I'd done virtual chats with with them going back uh, you know the previous year as well I was so proud of them I was so excited and they were so invigorating to watch and inspiring and and it was when I was sitting in the audience that I said damn it I want to do this I need to do this I need I need to remind myself that I can always learn that's a long reflection uh, about learning and unlearning and and I want to thank Diane for this conversation because I've got the book I've got Dear Genius I'm going to go through it I'm going to do some of uh, the exercises I'm really actually I'm really excited to do the exercise with you know clay or plasticine and actually shape out uh, the letters I'm excited to learn the alphabet backwards I'm really excited to go back to the foundation and see what I can do. Just like Neil Peart went back to relearning a different way of holding the drumsticks after decades of hammering on those drums. I'm so excited about what that's going to do, what that's going to bring me as a writer and as a person and, and what that's going to open up for me. So that's it for this reflection that's it for this episode just a reminder if you have a reflection that you'd like to share on this episode or any episode leave the comments over at starkreflections.ca you can at me on twitter i'm at mark leslie or even better even better dear dear listener i really do want to hear your voice over at starkreflections.ca slash 300 i want you to go check out the form, upload your own reflective audio for anything. It could be any of these episodes. It could be anything related to your reflections on writing and publishing, anything related to the business. Would love to hear your reflections because I think the 300th episode, having, having the diversity of voices that come from you would make it way better than just me talking and reflecting. I want to learn from your reflections, and I know there are other listeners who will be able to learn from your reflections as well. So thank you in advance for sharing your awesome reflections, and thank you so much for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. Like I said before, I'd love it if you could share this episode or any of the episodes that you really enjoyed with someone else that you think would get value, because that's kind of paying it forward, and of course it helps me as well. So thanks for helping me, thanks for being with me, and thank you for listening to this podcast. And thank you to Diane, who was our special guest on this episode. And so, until next week, and episode 294, this is, as always, Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.